1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll be for at least a couple more weeks, I think. And we come today to verses 19 through 22. In these closing verses of 1 Thessalonians, as Paul is kind of hitting the home stretch, he briefly deals with two areas of the Christian life that I believe need serious attention in our lives today. The first is our relationship to the truth, and the second is our relationship to the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at those over the next few weeks. Today we're in verses 19 through 22, and we're going to look at our relationship to the truth, or more specifically, how to respond to the truth. I uh, briefly thought about entitling this sermon, How to Listen to a Sermon, But truth is involved in much, much more than just listening to a sermon. As you read the scripture, as you uh, engage in, in discussions with other believers, there are many different ways that the truth comes into our lives. And so this is the topic, how to respond to the truth. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. Do not quench the spirit. Other translations say, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test everything. Hold on to what is good. Avoid every kind of evil. Now, I don't have the current statistics on church attendance. I hear out there that um, a lot of churches have suffered a lot of reduction in attendance uh, after the pandemic. Uh, I heard somebody say the other day that that probably is true, that people who just came to church, you know, for customer service and got out of the habit over the last two years of going may not ever make their way back in. We don't know. But I do have an idea that when you look at the moral decay of our society, I have a good idea that there are a lot more people who sit in church and hear the truth than there are who actually obey the truth that they hear. Otherwise, our society would not be in the shape it's in. Now, before I go any further, I need to make sure that you understand, if maybe this is the first time you've tuned into one of our lessons, but I just want to make sure that you understand, the people in the room know this, we believe there is objective truth. We believe that the Bible is the Word of God and is the final authority for our lives. There is such a thing as truth. Now, in our society, you hear things like, well, that might be your truth, but that's not my truth. Well, we believe there is a capital T, truth. We're living in a society where Pilate's quote could be the theme of the society. What is truth? In response to that, Jesus said to the Father, Thy word is truth. And he himself said to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So here at Open Door, we believe there is a final authority. It is the word of God. That is truth. Wanted to make sure you understood that's our presupposition going in. There is truth. I may not like it, sometimes I don't, but the Bible is truth. It is not up for a vote, it is not up for legislation, it is truth. So Paul gives us, in these verses, a a pretty simple checklist on how we should respond to the truth. Verse 19, don't put out the Spirit's fire, or don't quench the Spirit. I don't know how long it's been since the last time you used the word quench, but this particular word means to extinguish, which is why some translations say don't put out the Spirit's fire, or to suppress or to stifle. And when I heard that, I immediately heard Archie Bunkle say, stifle, Edith. You know, uh, but you know, we, we understand that stifle, suppress, extinguish, Now, it's important for us, and we'll talk about this more next week, to remember that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's not a thing. 
It's not an influence. He has influence, but the Holy Spirit is a person. And so if you can think about how you would extinguish a person's spirit or suppress them or stifle them, then that gives you some insight how it's possible to quench the Holy Spirit. You can just ignore his voice when you hear him say things like, change that attitude, ask for forgiveness, work on this area of your life, get your priorities straight. We can just ignore that. Or we can flat out disobey what he's telling us to do. Or I think what we do a lot of times is we try to drown out his voice with other voices or other activities. You know, if you're reading a particularly convicting passage of scripture, it's just easy to go back to the 23rd Psalm, you know, flee for comfort to the Psalms because it's uncomfortable with what God is talking to me about here. What Paul is saying is when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, don't ignore him. When you hear the truth, don't put out the Spirit's fire. Don't quench the Spirit. Now, you can relax because I'm, I do not intend to change our morning schedule or how we do things, but there have been times after a message on a Sunday when I have felt like the appropriate response would be for us to just sit quietly and prayerfully for a while before we leave. Because sometimes what happens is the Holy Spirit talks to us and he convicts us about something. But as soon as the final prayer is said, we're up talking to somebody else about what happened last week or what's going to happen this week. And by the time we get to our vehicle, we have put out the Spirit's fire. Not in intentionally, but just we've gotten involved in other things. Sometimes it's good just to sit, you know, it's that selah word from the Psalms, which means pause and reflect and think about this. I know that that's true in our own personal devotional life. Our, our personal devotional life tends to be, Lord, here's my list of what I need from you today. Thank you very much. And we're out the door and on our way, rather than taking the time to listen to what he wants to tell us. So when you come across the truth, don't put it out. <laughs> don't suppress it. Don't try to stifle it. Don't ignore it. Don't try to distract yourself from it. Respond to the truth. The second thing he says is don't treat prophecies with contempt. In other words, don't minimize the revelation of truth. I think sometimes we take for granted the many avenues that we have to, to hear truth. I mean, I, you could sit on YouTube probably all week long, and listen to sermons from all over the place. Um, we have a TV that's got apps on it, and uh, I don't know how many different churches i found who stream their services and who have archives of their services. I can listen to just about anything out there that I want to. You know, we have so many opportunities to hear truth. Now, some of it's not truth, you know, but, but we have so many opportunities to hear truth that if we're not careful, we take it for granted. And what Paul is saying here is don't minimize the revelation of truth. Don't treat prophecies with contempt. Now, as I understand prophecy in the scripture, there were two kinds of prophecy. There is telling the future, which I was told was called foretelling, F-O-R-E, and the second part of prophecy is proclaiming the word of God, forth telling, telling forth the word of God. Even the prophets in the Old Testament who prophesied about the future, you know, Daniel, Ezekiel, the different places that said this is what's going to happen, there was also a significant element in their message of telling forth this is what the Lord is saying. And you hear over and over and over. Thus saith the Lord. I personally, personally believe that today prophecy is primarily forth telling, telling forth the word of God. There are those 
who have a gift of prophecy that can maybe predict things. But I think primarily when Paul says here, don't treat prophecies with contempt, he's talking about the revelation of the word of God. He's talking about telling forth God's word. And what he's saying is, don't treat the preaching of the word with contempt. Don't treat preaching as though it is worthless or of no value. And as I was working on that, I thought, but wait a minute. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, he uses the phrase, the foolishness of preaching. So I went there and I looked at the context and what he was talking about. He's not saying that preaching is foolish or that the truth is foolish. What he's saying is it seemed to the people who were listening that this was foolishness that Paul was talking about. And that's still true today. People who profess themselves wise but are really fools scoff at the message of the virgin birth or the death of Christ on the cross or the empty tomb. And so it seems to them to be foolishness. I was talking about that one Sunday several years ago and a lady in the church came up to me after church and said, Pastor Ken, it is not foolishness. She said, the smartest thing I do all week long is come to church to hear you preach. You know? And there is something about, the, not me, but the truth that, that is life-changing. I started preaching full-time when I was barely 20. And I had people in my church who had served God three times longer than I'd been alive. Our organist, now this is the 1970s, so it's not as far-fetched as it seems, and this is the truth. Our organist was born in the 1890s. <laughs> and here I am, some wet behind the ears 20-year-old, preaching to these people. And I learned early on, if I was going to have anything to say, I was going to have to be able to back it up by the word of God. This is what the Bible says. I still try to do that. Because you don't come, at least I hope you don't come to church to hear from Ken. I hope you come to church to hear from God. And it's so important that we don't minimize the revelation of God presented to us through the truth. And then he says, test everything by the truth. Test everything by the truth. It's an interesting word, test. It, it means to prove or to test the genuineness of something. It was used by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 of, of testing metals to, to determine how pure they were. In Luke, it was used of testing the ability of a new uh, oxen that you were going to hire or, or buy to do its work. Basically what he's saying is test things to make sure they're true. Test things to make sure they're genuine. Test everything by the Bible. I feel like I need to harp on that a little bit. Test everything by the Bible. There are so many areas in our public arena today that are considered political. And if preachers speak on them, they're told, stay out of politics. But so many of the issues of today, under the guise of political issues, are really spiritual issues. And they need to be dealt with from a spiritual level. Test everything by the Bible. And that includes impressions you have and thoughts that you have. Test them by the scriptures. If you think God's telling you to do something that's contrary to the Bible, it's not God you're hearing from. The Holy Spirit will never contradict the Bible. This is capital T, truth, final authority for our lives. Now we're studying the Thessalonians. But in Acts chapter 17, Paul talks about the Bereans. 
And he says the Bereans, or Luke is talking about this, the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for the Bereans received the message with great eagerness, and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. I like that. (laughs) And every once in a while, people say, wait a minute, where did you come up with that? Or are you sure? And what about this verse? Great. I love it. Make sure that what I'm telling you is the truth. Make sure that what I'm saying is what the Scripture says. Paul went even further in Galatians chapter 1. He said, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Test everything by the Bible. Test everything by capital T truth. I don't know if you know this or not, but just because a preacher says it doesn't make it true. No matter how famous they are, no matter how popular they are, no matter how many books they've written, no matter how large their church is, just because a preacher says it doesn't make it true. Just because a Christian publishing house publishes it doesn't make it true. Just because a denomination issues a statement doesn't make it true. Let me say it one more time. Test everything by the Bible. That's not enough. Then he says, hold on to what's good. In other words, apply the truth personally. Hold on to it. When you find something that is true and genuine, grab hold of it and hold on to what is good. When you find the truth, hold on to it. Apply it personally in your life. And that that phrase, hold on to what is good, means to continue to believe it and to act consistently with what you believe. The Bible has stood the test of time. I did not do this. I was too tired. But I thought late last night I needed to go back through history and find the different places where religious or political leaders had said, we're going to stamp out the Bible and we're going to stamp out God, you know. And, And, you know, the word's still here. I remember there was a, a, I don't, have the details so you shouldn't even do this you, you can check me out on the search engine but there was a a uh, uh, the house I think it was where Voltaire lived who was a famous infidel who said he was going to wipe God out of the face of the earth and every mention of God well after he died his house was sold guess what to a Bible publishing company you know I mean just you know that just hang on to the truth the Bible has stood the test of of time. And so the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 2, we should pay the more earnest heed to the things that we've heard lest we let them slip. And one translation of that is let lest we let them leak away like a leaking vessel. I've had times when I've, I've brought home a to-go, you know, diet coke from a restaurant and I'll sit it down on the table come back in a couple minutes and there's Diet Coke all over the table because there was a slow leak in the bottom of that. That can happen to truth. If we're not holding on to it, it can just leak away. If we're not holding on to it, it can slip. When you find the truth, apply it personally and keep believing it and keep obeying it. And then he says... Avoid every kind of evil. And this is where it gets tough sometimes. We need to avoid what the truth has defined as evil. Not what society tells us, but what the truth defines as evil. Avoid it. Reject it. It means stay away from it. From anything that is contrary to the Word of God. Now, 
feel like I need to say this again, maybe for those who are watching for the first time. That does not mean you stay away from everybody who's not a Christian. It doesn't mean you avoid everybody who's not a Christian. If people in our lives who were Christians avoided us before we became Christians, how would we ever have become a Christian? How would we have ever known what it means to live the Christian life? And especially in our day and age, people outside of Christ desperately need to know some good, kind, loving Bible believing people. So don't leave here saying, I got to stay away from everybody who doesn't believe like I do. No. He's saying, you make sure in your life that you do not allow any kind or any form of evil to come into your life and your behavior. Now, the King James says, avoid every appearance of evil. And I always heard that verse interpreted that you shouldn't do anything that even looks like evil. You know, even if it appears like it might be evil, you need to not do it. And I, I kind of think that that's a, a pretty good rule of thumb for our behavior, especially as it relates to our testimony, to, to make sure that we're not doing something that could be misinterpreted as evil. But, I mean, there are going to be exceptions to that because there are some people who can find evil in anything. But, you know, but he, I dug into that word more in preparation for this lesson today. And, and I found that what he's saying in essence is this. Evil, there are many kinds of evil. Evil takes many forms. Evil appears in many different ways. And we should avoid evil regardless of how it appears or regardless of the form it takes. And that got me thinking. You know, sometimes in your study of the word you say, huh, let me mull on that a little bit. Push a pause right there and, and let me shift gears for just a second. I do not know where I got a hold of this concept. It might have been reading Francis Schaeffer or C.S. Lewis, I'm not sure, it may have been a preacher I heard, but somebody said decades ago, the group of people who write the dictionary will control the culture. Like, huh. Because they said, the persons that define the terms will define the conversation and ultimately define the culture. Now you think about that this afternoon and you're going to say, yeah. And you know the second thing you're going to say is, we lost the dictionary. Now, that came into my thoughts as I was thinking about how evil appears in Paul's admonition to avoid evil in every form it takes, however it appears. You do know that sometimes sin does not appear to be sin. You do know that the devil himself sometimes disguises himself as an angel of light. Are you ahead of me? Avoid evil no matter how it's wrapped up, no matter its appearance no matter the terms that are used. You realize, right, that we are in a world now where sin is called human rights. Where sin is called, and this staggers me, but where sin is called women's health care. We've lost the dictionary. And evil has put on an appearance of not evil. And I believe that as our world gets closer and closer to the return of Christ, it becomes more and more essential that we as believers hold on to the truth so that we are able to discern evil even when it comes in the appearance 
of something good. Now I'm just going to let that sit there and you mull on that over lunch. In the 1970s, Harold Lenzel wrote a book called The Battle for the Bible. And in it, he challenged what he saw as a weakening of the Bible's authority among Christian institutions, Bible colleges and seminaries, some denominations. And he warned that if Christians did not hold fast to the Bible as God's inerrant word, the final authority, the capital T, truth, that we would see in our world and in our churches a moral and societal decline. And he was right. We've lost the battle for the Bible. I mean, there are churches today where whole passages of the scripture are scorned and ridiculed. We have pastors call themselves reverend who deny the virgin birth, who deny the resurrection, who deny basic biblical principles. So no wonder in our society we see the blatant disrespect for the scripture and for anyone who will stand for the scripture because it's in the churches. You are aware, right, that we live in a society where everybody is free to think what they want to and express what they want to unless what you're expressing is a biblical truth. Then you're called a bigot or you're called hateful. And we're living in a society that is just flipped upside down. And Paul says it is so important that we maintain our relationship to the truth, that we hold on to it, and that we avoid evil no matter how it's dressed up. If I'm going to preach on the Bible, I'm going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man and woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let me give you a 45 minute sermon in three and a half minutes. It is profitable for doctrine. That's what God requires. That's the truth we're talking about. Here's how you're supposed to live. That's doctrine. Reproof is when we mess up, you know, when we get off track. That's where you read the Bible and say, oh, this is where I got off track. This is where I missed it. I'm so thankful that the Bible moves into correction because correction tells you how to get back on track. You know, anybody can tell you you messed up, but it, it, it's, it's nice that the scripture says, here's how you get it back. Here's correction, how you get it back on track. And instruction in righteousness is the idea of education on how to live your daily life. I'm so glad that the Bible is so practical to give us that instruction on every aspect of our lives. And the goal is that God's children would be perfect. Now don't freak out, that word means mature or complete. That is, we become what God wants us to be and furnished, that is, equipped to do what God wants you to do. If God has called you to something, he has provided through the word what you need to be able to do that. So Paul, writing to the Thessalonians and all through First and Second Thessalonians, he talks about the return of Christ and me ready. He says, in light of the return of Christ, don't quench the spirit. Don't treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything by the truth and apply it personally and hold on to what's good and avoid every kind of evil. It's a challenge, isn't it? but how we need it in our day. And again, not avoiding people, not rejecting people, but making sure that we keep ourselves in 
conjunction with the truth so that we are able to help those in our lives. The attitude that we must have is the attitude in this song that we're going to play at the end. You'll find the link to it in the uh, description or comment section. It's called I'm Listening, and it's by Chris McClarney, and it features Holland. Uh, I played it to you a few months ago, but it's a good song. Lord, I I don't want to miss a word you speak, and that needs to be our spirit. That needs to be our attitude. Lord, quiet my heart. Let me listen to you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for tuning in. You're dismissed.